Okay, I think we have everything engaged. So welcome everybody. This is our second last. Up until yesterday, we were saying it was the last because our, our K to three group is now done. Uh, energy was their last one because, uh, at, and grade four to six, you still have one more because you're. this is where we start space. Space used to just be grade six, but now it's four to six. So we will visit you at least one more time uh, before the year is over. So welcome, we're about to unpack some energy and hope you got some energy because we've got some ideas for you and, and maybe share that with the, with the students. So welcome and I'm gonna turn it right over to Ted who's gonna kind of just start us right off. And uh, if anything happens with videos today, just let us know um, if you can't hear something. Take it away, Ted. Uh... Thank you very much, Chris. If we could just go on, I'd like to always begin uh, opening with our acknowledgement of land. Um, before I just do a quick read of our acknowledgement, uh, acknowledgement of land, I'd just like to just play like, a short video um, of Elder Stephen Paquette and just his views and some maybe share some things to, to consider as you hear not only this land acknowledgement, um, but others uh, as you go to other meetings. So go ahead, Chris. What I've learned from my elders is that when we do acknowledgement of the land, uh, it's not about acknowledging whose land it belongs to, because that indigenous worldview, we never owned the land. We we're simply caretakers of it for future generations. Um, and what I've been taught uh, from my elders is that when we do that acknowledgement of the land, um, it's much more than just the territory. It's about relationships. It's about our relationships with people that share the land. It's our relationships with Mother Earth. It's our relationships with the four-legged, the finned, the feathered, the crawlers, the original stewards of Mother Earth. It's that relationship that we acknowledge with the trees. Uh, it's that acknowledgement that we have with the plant life um, that is part of the food chain and helps us exist. It gives us our medicines for healing, it gives us food for nutrients. It gives us our medicines for ceremonies. We acknowledge um, water. Water is sacred, water is life. Um, and what we're told is that when we acknowledge that water, that we always have to acknowledge the carriers of those teachings, which are the woman. So we do that in the same voice. We also acknowledge um, uh, the infinite wisdom of the grandfathers. Uh, then we take that to the next level, is which acknowledging that relationship that we have with father, son, or in some nations, brother, son. We acknowledge that relationship that we have with Nokomis, Grandma Moon, and how she cleanses Mother Earth. We acknowledge that relationship that we have with our distant relations, the star people. So when we talk about acknowledging the land, it's so much more so than just acknowledging what nation was on that. Um, as we know through uh, all throughout the history of Turtle Island is that indigenous people were for the most part nomadic people. Uh, they shifted, um, you know, they would move from season to season. Um, you know, it just so happens that Sheridan is, sits on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the credit, which I'm very proud to uh, always share and educate with people. But in the same breath, I also acknowledge that many, many other nations have, have walked this territory and that their ancestors are still here amongst us. Thanks. And keeping in mind then the uh, the uh, notion of um, relationship and not just with the land, but with um, the animals and the people and our friends and families and colleagues. I would just like to read our acknowledgement of land and people in the spirit of reconciliation. In the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. So welcome everyone. Uh, as Chris mentioned, this is uh, the um, uh, the second last uh, session uh, of this uh, little pilot series. Uh, Chris will talk about it later. We will be doing some others later on that you may want to tag on to, but you being the pilot teachers will get uh, have have a lot of the stuff that we already will be sharing. But there is the implementation happening, and we hope that not only through this uh, session but the the next one that you continually to gain confidence in working with this new science curriculum, that you have a sense of direction where you know you have to go to make a successful implementation. Those of you who are still gonna be piloting perhaps next year, because next year is not implementation 
for grades four to six, right? It's just uh, K to three. Um, but those of you may want to continue to pilot with it. Hopefully this uh, gives you an opportunity to again get that direction and feel that sense of confidence and efficacy that confidence and efficacy that you've got what it takes to, to make a successful uh, delivery of this course. Um, the agenda is, is quite similar to all the, all the other ones. Um, I will try to change up this front end as much as I can with some more uh, uh, content related specifically to this organizing idea. But it's difficult because we never know if there's going to be some new individuals joining us because not everybody is piloting uh, all the organizing ideas. Uh, some are piloting this one and perhaps another one. And so um, it's, it's we want to make sure that this front end is covered. So I will try to change it up as much as possible, maybe go through it a little bit quicker so that um, those of you have heard before uh, won't be too bogged down with it. So we'll take a look at deeper look at the cusps and uh, keep going. You could stay there. Uh, and um, and uh, a little bit on the instructional approach and a little bit on the assessment to be, to be touching on that. Uh, as you know, our organizing idea for this session is energy and the structure of this curriculum and all the other curriculum are, are very much the same where we have the organizing idea, guiding question and learner outcome. For this, uh, um, for all the, all the grade four organizing ideas, there's only one learner outcome for each organizing idea. And of course, the knowledge, understanding, skills and processes become the the uh, acronym CUSPs that you'll often hear us say. Um, one thing you'll notice, and you're probably aware by now, if you've been through the science course, or if you, uh, this is your second uh, or more uh, organizing idea, that the organizing ideas do um, um, meld together. In other words, in past, in the past or the, the old science course, um, each of those courses were kind of silos in their own. So the kindergarten teacher taught uh, his or her uh, science course and the grade one teacher taught his or her course and so on. As you could take, a, if you take a look at this progression uh, in, in particular, the energy, cause that's when we're on, we'd see that progression and the continuation of some of the big ideas and some of the big concepts move more fluidly. So things that are taught in kindergarten are all important and come back to be used in grade one and even grade two and grade three. So it's not a matter of just teaching something and thinking that that's the end of it. There is that transfer of those understandings. For grade four, we could see that students investigate um, um, objects without contact. Grade three was the contact forces. Grade four is focusing on non-contact forces. And by the time we get to grade five, we're talking about other forces such as buoyancy. Um, and uh, finally, grade six is kind of a little bit like the uh, grade three, you know, where we're talking more about interaction between objects and, uh, and the change that forces do create on objects. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the ideas transfer from course to course. And if transfer is truly our collective goal, that raises a couple questions sometimes. Um, I think we can all agree that what we do want at the end of the day is for students to take the things that we that we um, work with them in the, during our school year to take them not only to the next class so they can be successful in that uh, in the next teacher's uh, science course, but as they move up and out of our schools. So keeping that in mind, there are two questions that often come up with transfer then. And that's the next slide, Chris. Uh, what transfers and how do we teach transfer? So this first part of the um, uh, slide will be taking a look or presentation, excuse me, we'll be taking a look at what transfer. We do know that skills transfer, the hard skills, such as the critical thinking and evaluating, analyzing, and even some of those more, those softer skills, conflict resolution, self-regulation, those are all things that do transfer uh, uh, from place to place, context to context, and to over time. Not only do skills transfer, but individual concepts transfer. And we'll take a quick look at concepts once again, but if we take a look at both pictures, we could probably see in each context, um, the concept of courage perhaps, or perhaps independence. Uh, and that's the nature of concepts. We can, they can, we, can, we can identify them or experience them in different contexts. And that's what transfer is all about. And the same with understandings. Uh, these are different understandings um, from the different courses from grades one to four that we could see these understandings in the in these contexts as well. In the grade four example, uh, non-contact forces are invisible forces that can affect objects and materials. 
where we can see some invisible things making those, uh, for example, those flares come to the ground. Why are they going down and not continuing to go up, right? And so we get those understandings on a variety of contexts as well. So those three things do transfer the, the concepts within the knowledge column. And if you take a look at the definition from the guiding framework, uh, knowledge not only includes the concepts, but includes principles and rules. And you'll we'll come across some of those uh, in this um, in this organizing idea. Um, but the uh, skills and processes also transfer, especially the skills component, that, that verb within it. Kids can take those and, and uh, apply them to different contexts and situations. And finally, the understandings that we've just seen also transfer. So uh, let's just take a little closer look at each three of those things. Uh, we know that a concept is, for those of you who've been with us for a while, just an organizing idea of one or two words, such as a chair uh, with distinct attributes. In other words, a chair has four legs, a uh, back and a seat, uh, which makes it a chair. We don't categorize or classify a stool as a chair. It's not that it doesn't fit that concept because it doesn't have the back. So we give it a, it, it becomes a different concept of stool. And our concepts are found uh, throughout the curriculum guide, as you know. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll you just take a quick look at the organizing idea and the learning outcomes and so on. Oh, sorry, I was talking a slide too fast. Uh, just again, a reminder that they are some of the concepts are quite broad, such as energy, movement, and force, and they can be applied from subject to subject as well. So the broader the, the, the concept, the more transferability it has. And that allows us to do uh, those cross-curricular um, uh, activities. For example, we could talk about energy movement and force not only in science, but we could take a look at that and can we see, see that in physics uh, and wellness? Uh, can we see that perhaps in drama um, and art and so on? So the, the broader the, the concept, the more transferability it has and the more specific it does, the deeper we delve into that discipline and get a deeper and, and stronger understanding of that discipline. But those become less transferable and much more specific to that particular um, domain or discipline. Um, and they do provide us with a focus. For example, if we take a look at this picture, we could, you, you're looking at something, but if I said to focus on the concept of climate, you kind of see something a little bit different, perhaps. It provides a focus. So I asked you to look at uh, human activity. You might have noticed something in the picture or see it differently using the, the lens of human activity. So because trans concepts do transfer, they do help provide a focus with, uh, um, with what we are looking at. And so with that, we're gonna use the conceptual lens of concepts to take a quick look at uh, some of the organizing, or at, at this organizing idea. Um, they, the concepts are, are throughout, and uh, when you highlight them, when you find it, like take a close look and pick them out, you'll see that they are, are all over the place. So if we go to the next slide. Oh, maybe I didn't. I did highlight them. Um, we can we can see that there uh, there are the bulk of the uh, letters, the words in the guiding question and learning outcome, and the cusps are are concepts, and um, even the verbs themselves relate to concepts. You can see I uh, have in brackets um, behind investigation, investigate, investigation, because you investigate. What are you doing? We're uh, we're creating an investigation or conducting something, an investigation. Or for a describe something, we're creating something, a thing. It's a description, and a description is different than a narrative, for example. And so uh, because there are so many, what we want to do is um, identify those anchoring concepts or those key ones that are important uh, not only to this organizing idea, but to quite often move on and, and are brought up again in if not the next year's course, then even uh, the, the course uh, two grades up, it, they do come back and the students do revisit them. So to uh, pay close attention to these particular ones and to develop those is an important thing for us to consider as we move on. Um, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge column does help us to get a better sense of those concepts. Typically they are defined in that knowledge uh, uh, column. Uh, when you take a look at any of those concepts in the understanding, they're often defined there, and you can see the, the um, definition for non-contact forces there. Sometimes there are no um, definitions. In this particular case, there's no definition for attraction or repulsion, and we would have to provide that for students um, because they're not, we'd have to look for those and provide them ourselves. So not only are uh, the concept definitions present there, we also know that concepts have examples 
And the knowledge co co column also provides examples. In this particular case, um, it's examples of um, objects or items that contain magnets. Uh, and then once again, not everything has an example associated with it. If there are none, then some will have to be gen generated. But uh, those of you familiar with the science course and even the other curricula, you'll see lots of examples often uh, within that knowledge column. Um, where you could skip this uh, slide. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm redoing that. <laughs> so um, now individual concepts can be related to other concepts or other ideas as well. And that gives us a, a chance to get a broader understanding. In this particular case, I've taken out some of the big concepts and ideas out of the, this particular organizing unit to give help give a better picture of what this organizing um, unit is all about. Once again, it's mainly talking about force. And if you go straight down, see uh, force can be um, non-contact forces and have a source of either magnets or, or uh, gravity. When that gravity attracts and magnets um, attract and repel. And there's the north and south poles uh, associated with the magnets. Um, forces uh, are a push and a pulling, and there's that repel and attract, which are interactions between objects and so on, right? And then the objects have certain properties um, such as mass and material, and they're, uh, they have a certain distance away from the source. So the effect will change depending on the property and the distance of the object from the source of the force. And that's generally the, the big, broad idea of this organizing, um, I, uh, organizing idea. Moving on, uh, just a quick look at the understandings. Once again, the understandings um, are just how the facts and knowledge fit together in a logical and meaningful order. Uh, that's the definition that's given in the guiding framework. And to make sense of that, we'll just move to the next slide. Um, the knowledge that's being referred to are the individual concepts. So we can imagine on the left side, ideas or concepts like non-contact force and properties and distance and objects are all concepts within the knowledge column on that left side. Each of them have their own meaning and each of them have their own definition. So individually, they mean something. But when we put them together, we get a, something else. We get an understanding or, or a, a bigger thing, something that's bigger than just the individual um, meanings of those things. But the meaning, of, the understanding would make sense if you didn't know what those individual things were. So, for example, we can put these together to create two different understandings. Properties of objects determine the distance that non-contact forces have, or, or that non-contact non forces have an effect. In other words, um, um, their properties can determine how far away we are from a non-contact force before it has an effect. Um, there's another understanding below. There are the effects of non-contact forces, such as magnetism, on objects depend on the properties of the objects and the distance between the objects. Uh, and it's that last understanding, if we can go to the next slide, Chris, uh, that appears directly in the curriculum. Uh, the effects of non-contact forces on objects depend on the material properties of the objects and the distance between objects. I highlighted the word material. I'm not sure it's supposed to be there. I've got a question to tell Bert Ed about that. Um, it's the only time in the whole curriculum that material shows up in front of the word properties, and I'm not too sure if that's a typo or what, because we're just talking about properties. And so once again, um, we have uh, the, the concepts of properties and mass and um, distance and strength all in the knowledge piece. So if we develop all those and we put them together in that middle column, we'll have the understanding that the, the, the courses intending the kids uh, have when they, they're finished with this course. So we'll talk about how to develop that understanding shortly. Those, though, those are what understandings are though, and they too are transferable. For example, if we take that, uh, the understanding that non-contact forces from grade four, that non-contact forces are invisible forces that can affect objects and materials. Again, an understanding, we could see that in, in a variety of, con of contexts. And of course, the key concepts are non-contact forces um, and uh, affecting our objects and materials and how they and the effect of them are all present in each of those um, contexts. Next slide, please. Uh, so very quickly, this is, <laughs> these are the ideas we covered. The concepts have definitions and examples, and they are transferable as individual concepts. Uh, we can see how they're deepened through the grades in terms like energy and force and movement move through the grade to grade. 
Uh, concepts can provide a focus, such as a conceptual lens, and they can be put in relationship with each other. And when we do that, we create broader understandings, and those broader understandings can also be transferred. One final thing to look at, and that's the skills and procedures. Uh, three things to look at when we look through that lens, and as you're aware by now, that very first part of the uh, skills and procedures statement is the uh, is the verb that this is a specific skill, and the other part is the content related to the course. So we want to isolate them. But if we go to the next slide, after we isolate them, we just still have to be uh, give things a little bit of thought. Uh, for example, um, the word describe um, has a certain meaning uh, through the through the younger grades, and it's really giving a description using our senses to uh, describe the properties of something or to identify the properties of something. In this particular case, it looks like it might mean recall. And the reason I'm asking or suggesting you look at carefully, because if you ask kids to describe and they, they're familiar with describing by now, they've described uh, objects, they've described things they've seen or smelt and so on, they describe things that they measured. How would they describe how non-contact forces interact with objects, especially magnets? There's two, <laughs> right? There's, there's repel or attraction. Uh, so, and that's a really tough one to describe in, a, in its full sense of description. So perhaps it's just a recall question. Uh, same with the identify, it's perhaps just a recall question as well. There's, there's two sources of non-contact forces that they're looking at, and that's magnets and, and gravity in this particular idea. Same with uh, create. Uh, create's used in a certain way throughout the organizing idea, and I, I'm not too sure create's the right one here. Um, create a magnet using non-magnetized object. I think there's three ways you can do that. Uh, and there's, I can't find any more. Um, so they're not going to really create it. They're going to make a magnet for sure. But create to me means using, making something original. Uh, and that's more specific in the bottom one below where they de design a device. Uh, and so perhaps we just want to just pay attention so that when we do perhaps assess or so on, that we're really maybe making sure we give our appropriate feedback to the kids on what is exactly that they're doing. Um, um, just one other point, if I can get you to go back to that slide, please, right. Chris. Um, design is important in grade four, it does show up once in this organizing idea, but it really one of those big answering, anchoring concepts for the grade four computer science organizing idea. So uh, if you want to know a little bit more about design as you're uh, teaching this course, take a look at the computer science organizing idea, which is the next slide. And there is a process that they, in the knowledge column uh, that you may want to follow and introduce your kids to. Um, and there are some other information informational things about the design and design process. Now we're talking about computer science here, but in the early grades, um, it's not necessarily about coding. It's about uh, design thinking, computational thinking, which doesn't necessarily mean working on a computer because you could see designs can produce models, prototypes, blueprints, experiments and objects and so on. So to get kids, in, and when we're talking about transfer, we don't want kids to think about design only as something that they do with computer science, if we can use it where they can design something in with magnets or design a game or design something, and that's where the whole transfer comes along with the skills. So just because it's a computer science and it only shows up once in this organizing idea doesn't mean that that's the only times we want to braid out because transfer will never happen if we just uh, address it only in one isolated spot and never come back to it. Thanks, Chris. You can go on to the next slide. Um, so if we do take a look at all the skills and procedures for this organizing unit, we can see the ones I identified already. Uh, and then the other ones are highlighted in pink. And they all really, in a sense, mean the same thing when you look at it. It's all about that whole investigating part. And so I just want to draw your attention to that because I, I, it's worded so many different ways. I think that if we just focus on an investigation and what an investigation means, I think we could see that we can conduct four different investigations in this organizing idea or more if we really wanted to uh, and not have to think about why, what's the difference between conducting an investigation or conducting an experiment and so on. They're all fairly similar. And this, I'll show you that in the next slide, I think. Um, well, that's what we just did, kind of looking at the organizing idea, pulling out those important ones. 
Um, there are some the, some skills and procedures that, that proceed through the course and are rep repetitious through the course. And of course, there's a lot of skills and the competencies, especially in the numeracy and literacy progressions. And when I'm talking about with the competencies, I'm talking about things like research, collaboration, communication. We know that discussion is the science skill that shows up so often. And so we can look to those competencies uh, to get some direction as to what students in grade four need, need to be able to do when it comes to collaboration, for example, or problem solving. So those that's the big thing. That's the third tip uh, is to look at that. And so when we do that, find the big ones, we see the big ones for this organizing idea, again, our experiment, perhaps following instructions when you're creating a magnet. I don't know if they could, Chris, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know if they'll be able to, to figure that out on their own, making electromagnets and so on. They may. Um, yeah. Um, then, um, uh, then we could take a look at, um, at all these things. What I want to do right though is, is really take a look at the investigations component. Cause when we're experimenting, you're going to get your, your, your process and everything through different, um, grades actually. So if you can click that link, did I, did I not hook the link up to it? Well, maybe I did. Um, what I've done was I highlighted for you um, all the different bits that may be important when it comes to um, um, doing conducting an investigation. The grade two um, computer or scientific methods unit identifies those steps. All right. Um, so that's what we have to look at because they don't the steps aren't identified in grade three or grade four. And you have a link to all this information as well, and and they're downloadable. Though this document will be in your folder of stuff. Um, grade two also talks about objectivity uh, with the data. Grade one talks about observations and recording data. So there's some information there you may want to look at. Um, grade three does talk about uh, types of scientific investigations. So you'll notice that there's the word uh, experiment. Well, an experimental investigation is different than a comparative one or a descriptive one. Uh, and grade three um, computer sci or scientific methods looked at those. So those are things that by grade four students should be aware of and be expected to know. Uh, of course, analysis is one of the steps in, in, um, in the investigative process. So there's some thoughts about analysis there. And the couple, the, the key thing about grade four scientific methods is it does focus on the data uh, and getting collecting qualitative, quantitative data uh, and data and evidence that's reliable and valid. So those concepts are looked into. I'm not too sure if you want to get that. For sure, the, the scientific procedure grade two is one. If you're going to do those experiments, uh, if you want to follow the experiment investigated model, those are, that would be the process you'd look at. And next slide, or going back to the main slide deck, I guess. Um, we can go on to the next slide, Chris. Um, so again, just to review those things, all the things we looked at uh, in each of those um, columns, the concepts, the understandings and skills. And again, I'm talking about the specific skills such as investigating, not, uh, the, not the content that goes with it. I'm just talking about creating or designing those kinds of skills do transfer as well. And the question now that the second question that we had on our list was, how do we do this now that we know what transfers, what process do we do to promote transfer? And for that, we look at, uh, once again, you've heard it before from me, uh, the surface deep uh, and transfer um, stages of learning. Um, quite often we rush into the deep of the transfer. We, we start these big projects, but we have to stop and make sure that students have a good solid understanding of those individual concepts before we move on. I've got them identified as a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional thing there. If you take a look, the two-dimensional one is just kids can say the definition of it. They've memorized the definition of the concept and they can tell it back to you. But as we know, concepts have examples and non-examples. So having kids distinguish between examples and non-examples is also at the service level. We wanna make sure they have a good solid understanding of those individual concepts that later on we know make up the understanding. We want to take time to talk about if we're going to do the investigation process for those six steps, we want to stop and go through with those. And, and there's different things such as analyzing some things that perhaps go along with it. But we want to give kids some exposure to those skills and start practicing at the surface level 
before we sort of get into the meat of the course, we could still use some of the course content, but we don't want to get into developing those deep understandings until perhaps the skills are, are there. When we get to the deep level, that's where we bring those understandings uh, or create those understandings. We bring those concepts together and that's identified at that sort of uh, three-pronged cube or, or the, yeah, the connection of cubes. Those are the relationships or the statements of understanding that have the different concepts built in them. We can use a uh, context that is uncomplicated, uncomplicated and familiar at the start and move on with more guidance to perhaps the course content, or we can save the course content perhaps for more of a transfer uh, um, situation where they're working independently now to develop those understandings. So they know the skills, understand the concepts, and then at the transfer, they can develop those understandings on their own, depending on how you set things up. So we move from uh, surface to making sure they, they we spend a lot of time getting those things. We we take deep, we we give them different opportunities and different contexts to practice those skills and, and apply those understandings until we can let their hands go a little bit more with the transfer activities and let them work independently in unfamiliar contexts that they've never seen before. Um, there are a variety of uh, instructional approaches. Uh, I know you, uh, there are a lot that you do know and out there and you do use. I just want to give, I'm just providing some examples here. Um, concept attainment is one way to develop concepts. Uh, card sorts and classified are also there. We've got making analogies, all kinds of things to develop that understanding of the specific concepts and about the skills. Um, I have many examples of some of those strat concepts that are important in the, uh, in, in the um, investigation process. Because quite often we'll be we'll use those words in an investigation, but students may not be particularly clear on what they mean. So there's some uh, suggestions there, uh, and they show up in things like uh, um, the teaching of skills process. So not only teach the concepts, we also teach the skills. So at a surface level, if we're teaching a skill for the first time, we do want to slow it down, and I usually use uh, or talk about using a direct teaching. Uh, a thinking skills approach. Uh, Chris, if you could click on the investigating and experimenting one at the very bottom, um, give you an example. The left side of this um, of this um, uh, I guess document has um, um, what the teacher does, and I think I've got the wrong link to you, so uh, that's all right. I'll make sure that the right link is the right document is there for you later. But it, the surface is what the this is what the teacher does for planning. And if you could take a look at it really, we're teaching a skill. We break it down into little individual parts, uh, which is step number three. Uh, step number four is identify those concepts in those steps, uh, and um, Step number five is identify those sub uh, skills within the steps. So if we're going to give the kids these steps and demonstrate it, we want to make sure they understand what those different things are. Um, if you do me a favor and just go back to the steps, Chris. Uh, step four. Um, so I've given examples and I'm not too sure. Just hover and I'm not sure if those are links to those or not in this document uh, over examples. Over the no, they're they're not lighting up. I'll make sure that they're linked to have the right one. So with all those seven steps, um, we do uh, we there are those concepts. Let's say, what's a prediction? What's an investigation? What is an observation? What's an analysis? What's a conclusion? Those are all things that kids will need to know. And I'll have some links there for you to help explain. And you may have your own examples, but those are using some concept attainment. Um, um, activities that you may want to use. Even when it comes to the sub skills, uh, getting kids to ask questions or making predictions is, a, is something else they need to do. And eventually they get to, they're expected to plan their investigations. Um, there's an example there. You don't have to go to that, Chris, but just as an elementary teacher who's getting the kids off and running um, by, um, and they're planning their own experiment. She's given the materials and they know what they have to do, but they now they're going to have to plan out how they're going to use the stuff to to make experiments and to test what they need to test to to reach their conclusions. Uh, and so those are all things that, again, are important to to familiarize the students before we go at the surface level, before we go whole hog and, and starting uh, going and having them beginning to do this as a whole procedure. 
And I'm pretty much me to the end. Um, just a couple quick things here. When it comes to the deep level, um, what we want to make sure is that at this point, that's where we help students make those connections with the understand in, in the understandings. So we're taking those concepts, putting them together, and helping to draw that out. We can do that um, through a variety of ways. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, some, some useful ways of doing that are having kids doing mind maps, flow charts, um, and asking kids to explain their thinking at all times. Why do you think this is like this? And Chris is full of questions all the time. When he does, she does your presentation, you'll hear her ask those wonderful, marvelous questions to the kids. So ask them to explain what they think and why. Um, and then there's another thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is asking conceptual questions. And I'll show that on the next slide. So we could take those concepts that we take in our, in, um, in our organizing ideas uh, and ask questions. You know, does A cause B, does this cause this happen and show how they're explaining their understanding, they're showing how these ideas are relating and that's showing that understanding. So an example is at the bottom, how does an object's mass or what role does an object's mass play in the strength of attraction forces and the repulsion forces? Kids need to know what mass is, what how to determine strength, what attraction forces and what repulsion force is. Uh, before they continue, can uh, answer that question. Um, if you go to the next slide, thanks. Um, the, uh, we could take, to create those concept, conceptual questions, we could take our understandings and turn them into questions. Um, and uh, I think I have a slide out of order here. Can you see, go to the next slide for me, Chris? Sure. Yeah, this slide should have been before the other one. But if we take those understandings, um, for example, the effects of non-contact forces and objects. Uh, it's written there. We take that statement, and turn it to a question. That can be the, the problem that faces students for an experiment. We know that the first step in the investigation is to ask that question or, or to what's, what's the problem. And so um, that can be a good place to start to develop that understanding. Because at the end of the day, the last thing they do or the last step is to form a conclusion. And they're going to, based on the experiment, to conclude whether or not non-contact forces of an object depend on the material and the distance between objects. So they'll go through a variety of experiments. If you go back to that next slide, Chris, the previous slide. Um, in, so again, to develop that understanding, we know that on one side, we've got all this knowledge and skill and concepts that we've developed individually. We've talked about experiment, what the steps in, in an investigation are perhaps, what an analysis is, what a conclusion is, what a prediction is. That's all at the surface level. What are those things? Now we can apply it to develop that understanding and that particular one. So if you go to that link template, I'll show you what I mean. So the understanding becomes the question for the investigation in this particular case. Uh, and students can work at completing this is, and it's got all the steps there for the investigation. What is my prediction? Uh, we know that to make a prediction, we have to re rely on past knowledge and past um, um, and, and previous experiences. Um, in grade three, uh, we take a look at the different types. So this would be an experimental investigation because I'm looking for causes and effects here. And here's my plan. Here's how I plan to do this. So it's not written down there because the, eventually we'll want the kids to be able to plan the experiments based on the material they have. And why did the experiment work? What do you have to do to change it? How will you record it, the data? What will you do to um, get that information and organize it? Um, what do you notice about the information? So you go and do the provide the analysis there, and then the final two steps are there. Once again, if you go back to the other document, it shows examples of what analysis is, some observation record sheets that are linked into that document um, on investigations that I showed you earlier. So all those things at the surface level slide that you had as well, all those links are there to, to help along if you want to look at that. And I think that brings me pretty much to, to an it close here. For a couple of quick things, though, um, I think we just have to mention one other thing. Oh, there's another uh, example of how to help, help kids demonstrate their understanding. On the left, you can see a, a variety of individual concepts taken from this organizing idea and providing kids opportunities to say, put these together. How do these ideas and concepts relate to each other? If they can put them into uh, together into something such as the diagram on the left, where non-contract forces can be magnetism or gravity, 
magnetism and gravity are both attract, can be attractive uh, or are attraction forces, but magnetism can also have a repulsive force. Uh, they both have a certain strength and that often depends on distance and properties of the objects. You might wanna break it down to smaller ones if they've never done the concept maps before. But you can see how being able to put that together, students need to know the, um, the um, individual concepts themselves, but then putting it together in a concept map shows that they have a broader understanding of how those are all related, which, would, which is what understandings are. And I might want to add in at this point, too, that because you are just starting this this year and they haven't arrived at your doorstep with the previous knowledge from grade four, going back and having that conversation about contact forces is going to be necessary, right? They, they're going to need that grade four background. So we had a similar one that Ted created there for the cards. So it might be a good opportunity to go back, do a brief overview of what are the contact forces, and then could they could they create the, the two different sort of maps here or the two different um, uh, combinations of cards to see if they can actually sort them out? That would be a great way to find out that they actually understand what's going on between the two because they won't have that background knowledge. So for this year, you will have to go back and do that work. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then finally, when we get to the transfer, that's that's where they're uh, the the uh, skills and the understandings are are at a point where kids can work independently, and now we can create that new context where perhaps the transfer activity is that design uh, skills and procedures thing where they're designing something that uses magnets. They have to use their understandings to make that project uh, work, and that would be a good transfer activity that you can um, use with your kids. And I know Chris has a whole ton more, so. We'll get going here. And next slide. Uh, along the way, then, assessment is important. Um, sometimes if we do a pre-assessment, maybe kids already know the, 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 uh, what an analysis is or what an investigation. They know the steps that are to be taken. They know what properties are. They know what all these things are. So you do a pre-assessment to find out what, as we usually do, and then what they don't know we make sure we um, take some time to instruct towards that and then do some other formative assessments to see where they're ready to go into the deep learning. And that's where we start applying the skills to the concepts and the understandings to create those, those broader pictures. And when they can demonstrate they do that, we can move into the transfer activities and give them that independence. You can go to the next slide, Chris. And here are just some questions you can, can look at to help determine your assessment activities. Uh, if they can do these things, you can see some questions associated with each of those. For example, um, not just defining a concept, is, but defining a concept in their own words. Can they do that, for example? Um, and if they can do those things, they become good um, assessment feedback for yourself to decide to move on to the next stage of learning. And finally, I know what we're waiting for. So we, Chris is going to provide us with all kinds of learning activities. And as she does, so I hope you can say, okay, this would be good for a transfer for a surface learning activity. This would be good for deepening the learning. And this would be good to apply for uh, put towards a transfer. So take it away, Chris. And that's that's exactly right. I think everything that, that Ted has shown you so far is really where we want to um, really differentiate to for where the students are at, right? Who's going to need more guided and who's really ready to ask that inquiry question and and they're old enough at this point for them to do some of that uh, legwork and some of that research on their own. And quite frankly, uh, magnets aren't, aren't generally new to children. They've all experienced them in some form or rather. Do they see great big ones that we might have in the lab? Maybe not, but they, they are familiar with the concept. And so from that perspective, I kind of like to jump in again. I'm, I'm not a person who likes to stand up and deliver. I'm more of a Let's throw some ideas at them. And maybe it's an opening video. And I do have one. We're going to watch just a, a snippet of it. We're not going to watch the whole thing. But again, it's just how do I bring this forward for the student? And then where am I going to go with that for them to show me what their understandings are? But not just their understanding, also their area of interest. Because this, this particular organizing idea of magnets has kind of an unlimited imagination that you can apply their learning to. So, I mean, really, if they've got some keen interest or they want to design something or they want to build something, wow, I mean, we have an opportunity to really let them go at this and show us what they know. So kind of divided it into three pieces. The magnets or the magnetism is the biggest piece of this. The, 
the uh, gravity is, is something that we actually touched on already in grade three. Although it wasn't there, it was hard not to bring it into the conversation when we were talking about forces. So we did talk about it ever so briefly. So there are some videos in there that, again, you might want to revisit and just see if there's anything. But nonetheless, let's just have a look at where we might start here and take out some of the most famous guys. I mean, Bill Nye is always a, a great guy for us to go to. Um, and I've been quite strategic at some of the things that I've been putting onto the screens, as you'll see as we go along. But I just want to watch just a bit of this, and then I'm going to comment on this video. Magnetism. Magnets. You know, magnets stick to some things, like laboratory doors. Pretty nice decorations, huh? Magnetism is invisible. And magnetism comes from minerals found in the Earth. And the Earth is so full of these minerals that the Earth itself is a giant magnet. That's what makes compasses point north. A compass is just a magnet that's free to move. Now, the most common mineral that can be made into a magnet is iron. Right here is some iron powder, and this is a magnet. Watch. The magnet makes the iron powder form these lines, and we call that a magnetic field. Now, only three things can stick to a magnet. Iron, nickel, and cobalt. Nothing else will stick. Not rubber dinosaurs, aluminum, silver or copper coins, gold jewelry, but iron sticks great. Now, magnetism comes from moving electrons. You know what we call moving electrons? No. Call it electricity. Now, where would we get some electricity? Well, how about from this battery? Now, when I connect this battery, electricity will flow through this coil, and we'll get magnetism. Here we go. Watch. There's enough magnetism to hold up all this weight. Now, what'll happen when we disconnect the wire? Well, the magnetism will stop. You ready? Sure. Three. One thousand. Two. One thousand. One. One thousand. You live on a magnet. That's right. The Earth is a big magnet. So you get the idea. But, you know, I have to tell you that going through and trying to find resources that are manageable for us to use right now, uh, this has been a real adventure for me as well, in the sense that it gives me a chance to really see what's out there. This single video covers every item that we are about to unpack in this grade. Every term that we need is modeled in some form or other. And you just saw that I had this huge weight that it lifted, um, which goes to, you know, what happens when the when the magnet isn't as strong? Like, would it be able to lift that, right? Everything that we want to talk about is in that single video. So this is an opening one that I personally would use. I would just say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's a popcorn day. It's a 15 minute video. We're going to watch this. And we're just going to see what they glean from it. It's not that we need to get everything fleshed out, but because of their familiarity. Magnetism. Oh, sorry. Magnets. You know, magnets. Because of their familiarity already with magnets, this really goes quite a bit deeper. And it uses all the terminology that we want them to learn at the same time. So we can have a conversation at the end of it. There's some open-ended questions that, that get thrown out there, and, and we could certainly... But it's also one where you could even say, so what, what do you wonder about what you just saw? What do you wonder about what you know about magnets? What, what could you do with that? And just see what they're, what they're, and some of them you're gonna hear kids say, oh, that's so cool, I could make that. Or I, I, could, I could make a car that goes this. Okay, well, that's a great idea. Maybe we could think about how that might look, right? Especially since we talked about in grade three, contact forces, when wheels are on there, how does it make it easier when I'm just dragging a, a piece of wood across a carpet, how does that change it? And all those, the friction that gets involved. So day one, that's a great video. And if you know that everything that I need to unpack is in that unit, is in that single video, you have an opportunity then to sit down and decide how you wanna move forward with your unit. You know, do you wanna really just let them dive in now and just get their wonders and see how they might create or design an investigation and what is their, what's their question that they want to answer on day two or day three if you're looking for just a quick review and that's what i wrote here it's a great day two if you just want a review of 
what is a magnet again? How does it work? Because that's the foundation of where they're going to go. This is a great little video for that. So that just gives them an overall specific to magnets alone. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones in here. And I called them just unit supports. The science behind magnets. There's a magnetic field. Remember, he showed them what the magnetic field was right up front. Um, the BBC has a really great little video for that as well. And then experiments with magnets and printable magnetism book. I'm just going to show this one to you very quickly. We're not going to go through it. So this is a homeschooling layers of learning. And again, you would have to cite to make sure that you are uh, not breaking any copyrights here, but it is open and free resources. There's lots of really interesting stuff here about magnets and there is a printable book that you can use. Would you have to use the whole thing? That's up to you. You would need to go through it and decide if there's something there that would be, um, you know, if you need it in its entirety. Again, where your students are at are gonna determine where you wanna go with that as well. What? What? Okay. Oh, you want to know why this battery and cell wire? So the different kinds of magnets are on that source page as well. And I think students need to know that not every magnet is just a bar, right? There's different kinds of magnets. But how might I use those different magnets too is, is a, a good pondering question for them as they're designing. But I'm the kind of person who would rather just let them dive into a few things. So I just threw out some ideas. And I'm not saying that these are exclusive and the only things that you could come up with. But were you listening and watching to Bill Nye? What did he have to say? What did you see? What were your wonders at the end of that? And then here's some questions that I might say, you know, does one of these grab you more? Um, is this possible? You know, if I had a super huge magnet, could I pull that body towards me? Okay. Is it possible? And if so, explain. If not, explain, right? And depends on what angle they're going to go here because both an answers are possible. Um, this was at the beginning too. This is a wonderful desk tool. How would you make it? This is great for me to have all over my desk. I just want to get rid of, put something quickly on there. I want my, my paper clips and anything else on there. How would I make this? You could even tie it into entrepreneurism, right? And, and bring it into the money. And if you're talking about financial literacy right now in grade four, this is a great one. Okay, we want to create these. We want to, we want to sell them. There's your financial literacy conversation. Or this one, right? He did that really quick demo at the beginning. How does, how does this work again? Like, what's this all about? What's really happening here? Why are those, those shavings moving towards the poles, right? So why are we seeing that graphic? So again, these are just opening questions that may or may not grab some of your students. You might think of other ones that you wanna throw on there that are different. But again, I would prefer them to go in and try and use what they've just seen to go back now and set up their question go through the process of doing an investigation, keeping their data and, and moving from there. Or there's also what I call it do it yourself, right? What if I gave you a cork, a magnet, a needle, and a bowl of water? Could you make for me the compass? And if so, how? How are you gonna use the tools I gave you and end up with a compass? So they might have to do a little research on there, but if they kind of understand the process and if they don't, they'll do a little investigating and they need to do a little bit of research on it and that's fine. Um, how can a nail be magnetized? Like, how do I turn my nail into a magnet? How, what would your question be? What's your investigation? What would your process be? And there's actually a, a data sheet that I'm gonna show you that, that is there if you wanna use it. I'm not saying you have to, I'd prefer the kids actually come up with their own, but maybe you wanna do one together as a class, right? Maybe this is a demo that you wanna do. Um, you might even wanna say, and, and I was gonna put it in there, but often when we go out for dinner and this happened not too long ago with our grandson, we picked up the utensils, we took them out of the napkin that they were rolled in and once we took them out, he took his knife and he was able to lift up his fork. So his knife was magnetized, right? And we said, what do you think that is? How do you think that happened? He said, I don't know, how did that happen? So those are the kinds of things that we can even just show them, bring in some cutlery that does that without our intentions. Uh, why do farmers sometimes have cattle swallow magnets? There is a, if they're in a farming community, they already know the answer to that. If you're not in a farming community, they might say, are you kidding? Like, seriously? Yeah, seriously. Why? Why did they do that? 
right? So there's a good investigation. I wonder question, why would you do that? All linked to magnets. Again, just to broaden their understanding a little bit, this takes us around the Earth just to get a sense of how the Earth's magnetic field protects us. And we did talk about that earlier when we were talking about light and we talked about matter. We talked about that in a different organizing idea, but this kind of brings it back full circle and gives them an opportunity to see the magnetism of the Earth and how it functions to, to save us and, and to keep us safe. This is kind of a neat one too. And this might be one that you say to students, I'm gonna just show them a, a snippet. That's all I'm gonna show you and then see what you think of it. We're in North Carolina, where strange objects are being engulfed by a moldable magnetic monster. This is like some kind of weird alien goo from out of space. It is creepy. It may be out of this world weird, but this isn't from another planet. It's Magnetic Putty, eerily demonstrated by Joe Shankenberg, AKA Joey Shanks. My favorite part of this clip is when the blob eats a disco ball. It's like the death of disco all over again. We met Joey in his homemade laboratory to find out more about this strange attraction. I've done everything from making jars. So how do you make that putty move like that? Right, there's where I'd stop it and say to the kids, how's that happening? Because that's all he's doing is dropping a ball in it and all of a sudden it starts to move. So how does that happen? He does unpack it a little bit, but I mean, it's a great one to grab kids' attention and for them to do a little bit of investigating on their own. There's also some resources. I have some of them right behind me right now. I actually had a whole box of, of science books that I've had for years, actually. Um, and all of a sudden they're resurfacing because they're perfect for this curriculum. So um, this is one where it talks a little bit about these are graphic, uh, not graphic novels, but they're graphic science books. And so it's quite captivating for the students. And they like the idea that it's kind of more in this kind of a format rather than just the straight traditional, here's a definition, blah, blah, blah. But it starts off with just even a, a, a history of where magnets came from. How do we even determine them? And that, that you know, shepherds were finding that there's, there's was substance on the bottom of their shoes and they were sticking to the soil, right? And, and why, why were they sticking to the soil? So the kids can read about something like that. And these again, are just some sample resources that are available. You might already have them in the school and then you'll see the cover and say, oh, I think we have that one. Um, so you might wanna grab it. It also talks about the attractions, opposites, uh, repelling north, south, right? And, and building on those pieces. Uh, and it's called magnetism. And this whole series is built on the super max axiom. He's a super guy and he flies around and he tells all these stories as he investigates things. And the kids find that very captivating. They, they think it's an easy way to go through, but it is engaging for them. So that's one uh, source that, that we could use. I have a, num a number of other ones. These books also come with a teacher resource manual. It has a, um, a graphic science organizer. And what they do is they give about seven or eight pages to each one of the books. Each of the books also has tons of activities in it. So you read the story, but it's not just a story that you go through. Um, and this is one where they might do a trial where they're making their own magnet. And now they're gonna test, you know, how many paper clips could I pick up? Five, could I pick up 10? Could I pick up 15? Like, when did it power out? You know, is it a temporary magnet? Is it a permanent magnet? So it's just a way for them to record. So these are the kinds of things that are in that resource as well. So again, you might have that book in your school um, and just be looking for it. Gravity was the other piece that they were to talk about. It's a small component. But again, I was looking for, let's just talk about what gravity is. And now that we understand a little bit about forces from grade three, and we've talked a little bit about the forces, let's say of magnetism, it's kind of just the opposite, right? Everything's falling down. Why is it falling down? Because there's a pull from the earth. So the first one that's listed here is a great one to start with. It's a good opener. And then these ones would just be boosters that you could put on there as well. But they're not ones that you, I would never show all three of these in one day. And I'm not even sure I would use all three of them. You, you would have to go through and just see what works for your kids. What, what goes up? The what goes up, what comes down. That, that first one is a much better one, I think, of all of them. Here's another one for forces and motion, because this one also encompassed, we did this with the grade three students as well. 
um, but this one has gravity in it as well. And so you see him, Max asks him, he's, he's jump, bun, bungee jumping down, right? And why does he go down? Like, why doesn't he go up, right? He bounces back up with the with the elastic. I mean, that's a great example of what we did for contact, but, but he always goes down again. Why is he always going to go down again? And so they just talk about that again, right? So he talks about gravity is the reason that I keep falling down. So another resource that you might want to consider, there are some K5. Remember, we have mentioned that numerous times to bookmark K5. It is a place where you can go for math, for science. You can get some great resources there. More as formatives. If you just needed a one question sort of exit slip, great place to go because they're well done. And you could just take one of the questions. You don't, most of their sheets that they have are just four questions, but they're well done. And in this case, there's a number that are on magnets as well. And you can choose from whatever you want to do. I am not a worksheet advocate, but I am one that doesn't believe in reinventing the wheel. That if we have something short that we need, then let's just use that. So K5 is one to make sure that you kind of bookmark. There's another one. If you just want to read a story with them, um, what makes a magnet? And then this is the one that we've already looked at. And then the sources. So if you're looking to where to purchase them or who did the authors of those two books, those are there as well. Okay, so that's kind of our unit resources in a nutshell. Um, are there any questions first about, about any of the resources or anything that we've shown you today? We'll talk a little bit about what next steps are so that you can have a bit of a sense there. So feel free to just unmute yourself if you have any questions. Okay, so what we'll do then, I'll just stop the recording here because then we can just chat away in case somebody has a question, they don't feel comfortable on the 